Okay. So tonight I want to say a little bit about external wearable BMIs and how they work. This is going to be more of a discussion. So Brian, let's let's have a little repartee, but let me give some background first. Um, so the idea of a wearable device is gathering data from inside the brain and people who've listened to uh, us discussing things like this before, you know that we've discussed implantable devices, mostly Neuralink and BlackRock uh, has a um, an implantable device and a couple of other companies. And the last statistic I heard, I think was from 2021, there are now 40 people in the world that have an implantable device that's working. They're mostly for medical reasons. None of them are just for enhancement, um, but some of them are over uh, eight years old. The devices have been in, they're continuously working. A lot of problems have been solved. So there's been a fair amount of implantable devices. Um, also, we discuss hippocampal prosthesis, and I found out today that uh, some of those are going to be available very soon for medical reasons. So it's gone from theory to implantable device. But not everybody wants an implantable device. And one of the speakers um, that I'm going to refer to today, researchers, said that she thought an implantable device was actually dead in the water, which I think she's wrong because I think Elon Musk solved a lot of the um, difficulties of insertion with his Neuralink robot, but it is a difficult thing to do. So, um, so you're still going to want a wearable device. It's a lot easier. So I'm going to say a few things about that today. So the first question is, it seems a little um, difficult to imagine how this would work. I mean, we know about EEGs and um, the capabilities of them, a lot of people aren't aware of, but basically biological information comes in um, to your to your brain through sensors. So you have this direct data path from the external world to your brain. And even your eyes, it seems like nothing's touching them, but actually physically photons are impinging on your retina and they're physically hitting like the rhodopsin <laughs> molecule in there, right? And exciting its um, electronic state and it's sending a signal uh, directly to your brain. So the physical world directly interacts with the brain. So how do we get non-physical, use non-physical contact to actually get information from the brain? The answer is obvious though. Uh, I mean, I set it up to be like, whoa, this is really cool. But the answer is the same way we get radio and television um, by RF signals, right? Electrical and magnetical, magnetic signals can be collected externally. So EEG is a well-established method that Brian, I was gonna leave you to say something about that. Um, but I, but I have some pictures here. And no, then, those are ahead. great. Yeah, like I, <laughs> EEG has been well established since like the early part of the 20th century. Maybe yeah. even before that, a little bit for some people. But like, yeah. it's been well, well used. It's the most vented, vented uh, neuroimaging tool we have. Yeah, and it, and people have done a lot of different studies on it, and they've developed a lot of ways to understand the. Each of these um, connections that you can see is uh, is like a small antenna. It's fixed to the outside of the of the skull, and we discussed this in a previous meeting. But it basically picks up on the uh, electrical signals, or actually an average of the electrical signals of the part of the brain that's right under that small antenna. And then this last picture. Each of these lines is not a great picture, but each of these lines is sort of the data from one electrode. And it shows spiking data, right? I'm moving my cursor to simulate a line of spiking data. And then there's a lot of, um, I think, amazing mathematical techniques. The one that comes to mind first is Granger causality, which is sounds very imposing, but no, it's, it's, it's a ahead. very. I would say it's one of the more sophisticated techniques that's come up in the last like 20 years. Yeah, and but it's it's assumedly simple, and what I mean by that is not the theory, but my understanding is it's a couple of lines of code and it's able to find causality um, or probability really that that any of these two electrodes are doing something in a correlated fashion. So if you've got electrodes in the occipital region and you're seeing an image and then something, I don't, I don't really know, but say the motor cortex or something. So you see something and you want to grab it. And that's why those two things are correlated. You see it and then you want to move. So for example, it can pick up on, on data like that, but it can do a lot more sophisticated things, um, but not to the degree that, that we're going to discuss. So, 
all together, the technologies that exist, and Brian, I mentioned to you, I think a year ago, that there were wearable caps that um, could do the equivalent of fMRI, and you asked me to tell you more about it. That's the that's how I got the idea for this presentation. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but anyway, yeah. so go ahead. Yeah, I would say a lot of the, most of what we are talking about are what we call the non-invasive route for imaging, right? Yeah, Things yeah. Things that don't require any sort of penetration into your skull or skin breaking your skin or doing of any type. It's kind of the more, it's the more popular route people use for non-imaging. Too. Yeah. yeah. And what's being done, I think, is amazing. So I just want to show here that there's these are the, the main methods, right? There's EEG, uh, there's FNIR, which, Brian, you mentioned in a previous meeting, uh, and that's the devices that I chose to talk about for this. But there's also fMRI as a wearable cap, like an fMRI machine. I don't think I have a picture. It takes up a room. It's as big as, a, as an MRI. They can weigh a couple of tons, right? That's the fMRI that's that's classically been used. And then they have like a little cap that you can use and will give you the same equivalent information. You just walk around with it. So that's an enormous change in less than a decade, actually. And then there's um, diffusion tensor imaging, which is a subset of MRI, which focuses on on the water flow through the white matter of the brain. And I don't know of any wearable devices that use that yet, but I'm mentioning it as an external technology. No, it's often coupled with uh, fMRI, even when you're looking like I've, I've had to work on DTI before in a lab setting where we, we have to do analysis because that the information is collected at the same time as an MRI. So like many times when you look at DTI papers, it's often in conjunction with other additional fMRI data you have. So do they correlate the two? Is that how yeah. that works? Yeah. yeah. And it's I'd really nice for that. seeing like tractography. Like actually the nicer pictures you'll see in a DTI paper that have like a multicolored, like sort of like, sort of, yeah. it, they're very nice, pretty pictures. You'll see them. Yeah. Yeah. That I've used that in previous talks, like the brain bow that yeah, they yeah. use. I, I should have had an image for that. Yeah. That, that, that's a great example of the power of it because it's finding the circuitry in the brain and what parts are firing at the same time. And it's given us a lot of information on how um, information, for example, can be passed. I'm going to use this as an example, because we talked about the hippocampus, like from short-term to long-term memory those are pathways, right? It goes from, I don't know, the the um, the, the dentate gyrus through through the um, entorhinal cortex and then back up to the C1 and C2. And those are all directions and it has to go follow that path. And you can see that using um, uh, DTI. We got to let the music play, but I'll talk over it. So you can see, I mean, obviously this is a, a film to sell it, but the very simple... Um, cap to put on. You're not screwing on electrodes one by one. There's no gel, right? This girl is very comfortable. And these electrodes are removable and replaceable. So they can be for task, whatever you want to do or look at whatever. This is, um, I don't know what task she's doing, but I'm assuming they're measuring her prefrontal cortex for processing information or something. Um, so regardless of how ador adorable and comfortable they make this look, the idea is that you wear it and you gather data throughout the day. Um, and they're selling it as, as an enhancement of that kind. I'll let it play out and then I'll say a few more things. You see, well, it's just I, well, actually, we don't, like your bicycle helmet or something. Yeah, like I, I think, so from what I've seen, it just mentioned in the, the description for it, there's no... Um, no fibers attached to this, which looks right. Like yeah. Like EEG, this is picking it up. Um, my understanding is that it's using uh, far, far IR, and it's mm -hmm. it's penetrating at least to the bottom of the brain and then reflects back up, and they're getting a signal through the interference. So that's kind of crazy. Like most of the, the, the penetration length for an F nears is three centimeters. So, right. so yeah, this is a different, a different wavelength. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so that's mostly I showed that to show you the cap. This is a different company. Instead of Gower Labs, this is Open Water. I know her. And actually. Have you met her? I have her on LinkedIn. Um, she's she's interesting. From what I've mm -hmm. seen from F Mears, I I mean, you can play her uh, 
or portion there, but her, I think, con contribution for F Mears comes from more analysis and like more advanced analysis, essentially, on like three dimensional, ex like F Mears' yes. whole brain. Right. So let me see, because I only want to play a couple of minutes of her. So actually, let me discuss a presentation. Uh, I don't want to stop sharing. So I'll just leave that up. Um, so she gave this talk in 2018, and she gave a similar talk back in, in just four and then again, eight months ago, or eight and then four months ago. So she's still hot on the trail. She's doing a couple of things. But what struck me is that a lot of her work is using what she's calling phase wave beamforming technology. And she will describe it. I'm not going to play the whole thing. People who are interested can look into this or ask questions if they want. But she's basically using a combination of a of a small chip camera, which she says costs about a dollar each, um, LEDs and the uh, far IR light. And she's using that. Not only is it penetrating into the tissue, um, that's just normal F nears, but she's using what she calls a holographic approach. She's a little sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. She's a little sketchy in the description of it, but I'm assuming it's in the papers and well, I have some of the links to the papers. Yeah. But what's, go ahead. No, okay. I'll, I'll let you finish. Go ahead. What struck me is that it allows, you can use an array, like a spectroscopic array. And of course it would be curved because it goes around the head, but you can go to any depth and any location with what she calls, um, did she say a millimeter? A, a very, a very high level of uh, focus. And here's a quote. You can focus the energy and intensity extremely exquisitely precisely. Um, so she also claims that different areas of the brain, um, once you locate them, now this is a little, a little, um, it sounds very new wavy, but it's not. She says they have a harmonic signature. Now I had to look that technology up. It turns out it's from 1987, a researcher whose last name is A-D, A-D-E-E, -E, um, did a huge amount of research on what he called windows and what I would call resonances. And he was able to find in 1987 that there were different parts of the brain. He was using um, just microwave uh, um, radio frequencies, basically. And he was finding that different areas of the brain not only resonated with low power um, uh, frequencies of, of this ra um, radio waves that he was uh, beaming at the brain, but he was able to change the functionality of the of different areas. And what he proposed at that time was that there would be parts of the brain that would be associated with mood disorders, depression, anxiety, kleptomania, whatever. Um, and there's lots of mental disorders. And he was saying that once you found its window, you could affect it with, with radio frequency. So I don't know if she was inspired by his work or not. But that's basically, so he did this in 87. This is like uh, 40 years later. And that's basically what this cap can do. And what I'm going to show you in this in this video is she has a nice cartoon. Uh, it's better. Um, it's got more information than a cartoon. But she's got a nice image of how the array can, can transduce energy and how it can focus it and change the focus. So unless you have a, were you going to say something or I'll show the clip? No, no go ahead. Show the clip. Okay, so it's going to start with her discussing a variety of diseases, and uh, it's going to be about two or three minutes. I don't think we can hear the volume. Uh, so, like oh. the last clip, it's fine, but I don't think we can hear the volume per se that goes that comes into it. So you can't hear it. No. Let me make it a little louder. If that doesn't work, then I'll just show the image. Okay. saying that there's a lot of brain diseases and she feels that they're unaddressed uh, by by medicine. So she's very concerned with stroke, uh, brain cancer, mental disease. And she also has some ideas about Alzheimer's, which maybe I'll, I'll say a little later. But basically, she's saying that, especially with Alzheimer's, she made a very pithy statement. And my mother-in-law has Alzheimer's, so I'm going to agree with it. She says there's been something like 200 or 20, I don't remember, but some big number, right, more than one or two of pharmaceutical agents have been launched to treat Alzheimer's and the the research and journals show that none of them do anything. And, um, and she says each one is like a billion dollar launch, but she is going to say later, I'm not going to play the whole thing, that their addressable device, in addition to treating 
um, depression and other mental disorders can also treat Alzheimer's. Now, I don't know if that's true. She is not brought I mean, it into clinical is, treatment yet. Go ahead. Yeah, this is where I'm skeptical because like if her device <laughs> isn't an FNIRS device, that's just more about like detection and sort of scanning overall brain activity, because that's a huge problem to solve. If you're just doing a whole brain activity, right? what kind of treatment is she trying to do with FNIRS? Because like FNIRS based treatments, like I'm- So that's you got to- like, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's a good question. And I started the preparation of this talk saying, okay, we're going to do detection, but that can't be treatment. I have actually done a lot of research over the past uh, 10 days to, you know, to, to be sure of what I'm saying. And starting with the finding of the guy from 1987, and I'm sorry, I don't have his name. And I, I didn't realize that okay. he would be using him so much, but I can find it because I downloaded a bunch of his papers. I wanted to read them. Um, you can affect the brain with external RF um, at low power if you hit these right resonances. And I specifically remember that he found that 915 megahertz would have an effect on depression in whatever human subjects he was able to get in the era, but 904 megahertz had no effect. Now, what it's resonating with, I'm going to join you in skepticism, except Especially in 87, I have to say, I trust the data. If someone said it now, I'd be like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know. People making all kinds of crazy claims. But this guy had a very impeccable record. And in 1987, of course, there were people that would be dishonest, but his papers are not written that way. They're really, I mean, you have to make your own decision, right? Read his papers and make your own decision. But also many thousands of researchers then focused in on his idea of windows and it was replicated throughout the field from 87 okay. to to whatever well that's, so, that's that's the difference they had follow-up studies right yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Uh, i'm going to agree and i had some numbers here oh it's on a slide she's saying that this is well let me just let it go so um so that's that slide very early phase well, she she claims that she's about to start in humans, and I think maybe what she's doing since she has open water is um keeping it close to the vest, you know, because she wants to make water uh, money on this. So the thing I want to show is the next image, and so let's just give it another thirty seconds. That's it. This is a a wave front. And you can see it changing. And that's in a, the yellow is an array. This is an array. Look here. This is the focus point and you can change the depth of penetration into the tissue. Here's, that's the same thing here. So. So that, I mean, there's more here, but it seems to be um, difficult to show. So I will discuss it. No, I mean, I think it sounds like she's trying to solve two different problems. One, I think, is more difficult than the other, which is like the the actual holography aspect of what she's doing. Like actually mm -hmm. the three, the sort of whole brain coverage. Like one of the problem, one of the nice things about FNIRS is it's like very not sensitive to movement and it makes it very useful for yes. studying people on the go, right? Yes. Which is very useful, like, for example, for this kind of technology, when you think about studies, like, I've seen people create custom FNIRS headsets just for dealing with, like, mo like you know, exercise, like, you have, like, people like Mirex, like, like selling backpacks of, like, connected fibers with, like, yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. But, like, if she can do whole brain, that's, like, a whole nother level of, like, right. sophistication. Also, like, they're also like, you know, part of, I think a lot of big problem people had with FNIRS is that, you know, a lot of it is like one upsmanship with like the kind of headset you have. And yeah. it's always, that's always what people get interested in. Right. But it's also like another reason why some of the, the studies that people produce are very hard to replicate. Because right. if you have like a half a million dollar machine and you're like making this like statement, you need another facility that has a half million dollar machine or a million dollar machine to produce that again. So like if she's going to release this, it has to be a very low cost because like to me, if she gets buy-in from the community to do this, like to, to what, to what she's doing, 
like if she does it at a reasonable price, like that'd be that'd be insane. That'd be great for the field. Like yeah. in terms of replicability of like results. Right. Be, like, yeah. I'm going to agree with you. Um, the reason I think she's got the firepower behind her. Well, you know what? Everyone who listens and you, whatever, read her papers and look at the videos. I think the videos are just good tools to find the primary literature because she does not give a robust explanation and she never says the price. So actually, I don't care. I'm, I'm thinking more about the science, but you have a totally valid point about the price. But there's a few statements because I knew I couldn't play the whole thing. And it, it's very hard to get a statement from a video and and make a slide out of it. Um, but she is she makes a, a very a clear statement in her papers that you can get a very high density of data encoding using this this phase array, the, the IR phase array, um, and that it will pick up dynamical information and that it is not. I mean, obviously, if it's moving with your head, you're you don't have to. It's like in an MRI when they fix you, right? So you can you can't you can't move. In this case, the thing is fixed with you. It's always going to be in your frame. So there's no jitter, right? And that gives a lot of cleanness to the data. Um, she's saying, let's see, she's saying that she can detect information at a frequency right around that of visible light, that's terahertz frequency. That's a lot of resolution. Yeah. And she's furthermore saying that it's a billion times, this, she says this in her papers, I don't know how to prove it except to see a scan, a billion times higher resolution in real time than an fMRI, a typical medical fMRI. I, that's great. Um, I, I mean, I'm just saying she says it and she's got funded for it. Funding is one thing, whether or not, I think this is where the skeptic in me comes into play where also she's not like, like there are a couple of avenues I go for hearing updates about the FNIRS community. One, there's a giant Facebook group for the society of FNIRS members, mm -hmm. but she's also a part of, I think it I doesn't give not be surprised. updates on. And also like you'd never hear of her updates or papers really through these FNIRS, like, you know, journals, like, like a journal of like photonic. I, yeah. Like, like David Boas is somebody I follow because also he's like behind Homer and everything. But he also said that like the the science behind her her te like her tech is actually legit. And like I always remember yeah. that. And that's like he's like one of the earliest pioneers of FNIRS. And he's still at like the foreground, like journal of like photo like like photonic I guess, like, energy, I think. Yeah, journal photonic I think journal of photonics they have. Like I went to the first Meet up, meet up they had the first conference for FNIRS that's like official I went to that and I think she wasn't there but like a lot of people knew that this was around the corner but it's still not like proven yet like this is where like people I think in a lot like I remember when I first started working at my job like I told people about this because like I was an FNIRS like fanboy and I kind of wanted to see people like hear more about this because it solves a lot of problems right but yes, but it has yet to for one, how like for for people to get buy in for this. One of the things I often see is like people need tools to to be able to utilize the data she's going to produce for us, right? So like I've seen it often with a lot of other like manufacturers are going to take like their own proprietary tool route. So I don't know if it's along those lines where we're going to have to use software that she produces for us mm. for this, right? which That's like, something. sounds like yep. sampling of like whatever data she's providing is a lot. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to either like take a very small sample of that to analyze it on your, your laptop or your cluster at home or something. But the thing that makes me often skeptical about it is just the nature of, I guess, knowing what like the, for one, F nears has this limitation where it's three centimeters in it's often impacted by the kind of hair people have and the color of hair. And then often also you have to deal with like motion, motion artifacts are good. Like you can correct for that very robustly. Mm -hmm. And also the techniques behind analysis of F mirrors mirror that of fMRI very greatly, where you can get into things like statistical parametric mapping, things like SPM, for example, are widely used tools. And when you get into like the space that she's trying to get in where she's saying things like this is more powerful than MRI, you know, MRI well, more higher resolution and equal power. Right. 
But then mm -hmm. MRIs are also done on a voxel by voxel basis, right? Yes. And along different She's slices of images, it. right? Yes. And I haven't seen, and we do do things in looking at voxel clusters in FNIRS and also doing things on a voxel level. But like to say that, like, I don't know of many, like it's such exploratory. I, I understand, like, yeah. I guess what I'm just trying to say is like, you know, these these claims are very powerful, but like I have very, like with the established methodologies that people I get it. use, yeah. I don't know how they're going to look at her data. I understand. And uh, so I, and I agree with you, it's always best to be skeptical of larger claims, right? That's, that's, you have to be, but she has given a few um, measurable examples and one of them, and, and there are papers on this, she has used the um, the phase array that she's devised, this uh, near field IR. No, I think it's far long field. It's at the it's at the red end of the IR spectrum, so it's at the far the far end. Um, and she has used it to ex selectively explode um, people with glioblastoma cells. And you, as you know, that's an inoperable death sentence yeah. when you have a glioblastoma because this cell it's not a tumor; it's like it's diffuse cells. And she has videos. Uh, this is very clean data as far as I'm concerned. Um, you got to look at it for yourself and decide where you can visualize the glioblastoma cell in among the healthy neurons. And you see them turn into white voids as she hits them with this frequency. Okay. And the reason that works is because as, a, as, as the specific kind of fast growing cancer they are, they're very fragile. Slow blowing, blowing, growing cancers wouldn't be as affected. No, right. this is so. I think this is great. That's, when I yeah. first heard about her work, I did not mm -hmm. hear there weren't many examples of her work to look at. That's much newer. That's like yeah. 2020. Okay, okay. So, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard about this probably before when you first started this meetup. I actually heard about what she was doing. So, like, it's, it's yeah. been a while. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, okay. So, that's but, actually new information in my mind. And the, the other thing she has, which the, this is detection. But then she goes into being able to explode the blood clots. But she's claiming that, first of all, she can use the, the cap to detect stroke. She keeps referring to stroke as a plumbing problem. She's like, it's really simple. It's just a clog. Oh, and no. yeah, I know, I know. But um, I think that kind of far um, idealistic view is what a lot of visionaries have. I just I'm saying that because it is funny. She's like, it's just plumbing. But this plumbing problem, there is a clog and you do want to, you know, get it out if you can. And she's saying that she can detect exactly where the um, the blood flow is slowed down or stopped, which makes sense, right? Because the FNIRs can detect the movement of blood and it is dynamic. And yeah, then that's... she says that saves lives just because you're giving the hospital a heads up. This is not a drug user or a narcolepsy person. We got a stroke coming in and here's where it is. Well, you also get the two different aspects. You get oxygenated and deoxygenated yes. blood with, yeah. with FNIRS, which is You nice. get, right. And yeah. every minute delay, I didn't know this. I learned this from Mary Lou in one of her talks, but ev evidently there's like a hundred, no, maybe 10 million neurons die a minute of delay in the anoxic region around the stroke. Now, mm -hmm. that actually sounds like a lot. It's not really that many. You can take out a, like a thimble full of brain tissue and they say you won't notice it. I'm going to not want to volunteer for that. But there's a million is not that many. Nonetheless, the minutes pile up fast while you're in the waiting room. And if somebody thinks you're drunk or, you know, I don't know, somebody hit you in the head with a brick instead of having a stroke, that delay might go longer than you wish. So um, and the last piece is that she's claiming using organoids, so not in humans, and organoids are really tiny, that they're inducing strokes and then blasting them with the FNIRS technology, the same the same idea as the glioblastoma. And then after she says we blast them and destroy them, she says, oh, and this is at the same energy as an fMRI, but we're able to focus it. And she goes, it puts out heat. You can put it on a, on a, a submicron um, uh, area and that intense heat will break up a, a small or medium sized clot. So now that I don't know the glioblastoma, there's videos of it. I don't know about the stroke, but if she can do the glioblastoma, I don't see why she can't do the stroke. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah this is just so, I guess for F years, it's, <laughs> it's just such new territory where 
Yeah. You know, I think about all my experience with it and it's just like to hear somebody come through with like whole brain imaging on such a like low end in terms of low end like yeah. to that, right? Yeah. It's like a very profound thing. And like well, Yeah. And she's she's very proud of that. She actually was saying she said we did this because we didn't know that we couldn't. Uh, that it was impossible, but basically an MRI scan in the U.S., she says, costs about $5,000. I'm going to add something she didn't say, but in Africa, they use lower resolution and like a person can get it for like $80. But, yeah. you know, that's neither here I, nor there. It's I mean, not it, as good. It, research costs, it depends. It was like, right. I remember when we did, it was like $1,000 and that was low. At yeah. Yale. And then like, yeah. Most of the time, it's like a few thousand dollars because that's what bills your what's your insurance is getting billed, right? Yeah. Like, like for example, well, it also goes to resolution, right? MRI resolution yes. go from like one point five to three T to six T, then like seven T, which is like the normal. You don't need it. I think in a lot of cases, you don't need it that high. Well, what also it's, it's not suitable for humans, right? Like at yeah. a certain level, right? Like three yeah. T, I think, was the norm up until I think seven Tiga recently is like the new standard. But yeah. then you have like higher resolutions tested every, like I know the person who's also like head of multimodal imaging at the NIH. And he always told people that like, they're always testing new resolutions out. Yeah. Across like yeah. Decades and new scanners. So like when she's yeah. making assumptions about, you know, if it's resolution, if resolution is yeah. that, like I'm curious to what level of an MRI resolution she's talking about. If it's 1.5 T. Yeah, that's actually very believable to me if she can do that. Like if that's the lowest end resolution you can replicate, that's hugely valuable and it cuts down yeah. on like imaging yeah. costs, you know. And also you can run more subjects. That's part of the problem with like doing whole brain imaging is also you only get like maybe 30 to 40 subjects most of the time. Mm -hmm. and like you know you're you're just going from that and that's a good MRI that's a good MRI paper right yeah yeah well it's a medical paper they always have a very low number of subjects mm -hmm. um and I and I agree with what you're saying right so I don't know the resolution that she's comparing to and I don't I mean even if it's equal she's saying a billion times higher okay 10 to the ninth I don't care if it's equal, like the, the amount, you know, the claim is irrelevant to me because it's a cap. It's like a baseball hat. No, no, it's way it's more the, substantial than anything you can get from a cap, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. But she's also saying that because she, she she's kind of laughing about it. I think she's saying, look what I did. You know, it's very cool. And it is, is that she's got camera pixels, LCD, optogenetic L, L, LEDs, and the IR, um, you know, sources. And that's the whole thing. She doesn't have, you know, flip in electrons with the fMRI. She doesn't have a, a you know, a radio and a um, going this way and the magnetic detector going this way. She just has like the light source and the controllers on it, basically, right? The LCDs and the detector, which is the cameras. And I have to agree with her that that's that no one was going in that direction. Like even if it was half the resolution of an of an fMRI, I have to say that it's quite an achievement to have oh, yes. devised this device kind of like in this direction that no one is looking and they would never have looked. No, I, I, I think, think. I, I agree with you. I think that's like the, the coolest thing about this is that like it's non-invasive and you can do a yeah. whole brain image. Like yeah. A lot of the things that I think I think it's also like the difference is also there's an intention difference. So like with the things like Neuralink and sort of other device makers are focused on like intracranial implants. Yes. There's a difference in terms of what you're trying to do if you're trying to replace or regain some sort of function that somebody has lost or like or augment, right? Yeah. This is really just giving somebody what maybe a status quo is for that person like what's the diagnostic for that person and then possibly maybe doing a soft kind of fix to like helping them like, for, like do like fix something that's not too in, like in, fixing like a non like life-threatening brain issue i think like depression you mean as opposed yeah. to stroke yeah yeah like well non, there's people who would call it yeah i agree yes non-immediate um, so I'm gonna, I, yeah, I want to say a little bit more about that and then go back. I've only got a couple more slides. 
So the last part is she's calling it neurostimulation techniques, and she's very specific. She it's at fourteen minutes or almost fifteen minutes if when you watch the 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 link that's in my slides. Neurons under harmonic excitation, which is the same as going back to that guy's research with where he called it windows, can be made to open calcium channels and release neurotransmitters, which is exactly what was found in 1987. So I'm going to think she read those papers because it's the same thing and then is using that. So she's saying she can focus the excitation of the FNIRs, um on a, a center foci or region of the brain that is identified as being correlated with the onset of Parkinson's, depression. Like there are brain centers that are more active, epilepsy, um, that you can focus on. And she's saying that each area would furthermore have its own harmonic signature, which matches this other research, and that she can focus the energy of the FNIRS array and its intensity, which at no point she claims goes higher than an fMRI machine. She doesn't say, you know, how many T it is. Um, she can focus it precisely, which would control, in addition to the release of neurotransmitters for that region, she's claiming that, now this I don't think is proven, that it controls synaptogenesis in that region, neurogenesis, in addition to the neurotransmitter levels and the amount of signaling and the pattern of neurotransmitter levels. Um, so that, to me... I think that's the payload here. I think the imaging is is sort of maybe how she's getting her funding, but there's lots of ways to do imaging, right? This, it would be unique. And I, be, I don't know that she's got this technology, but I believe this technology can be achieved using a wearable device. Oh, I, I, I agree with you. And I'm actually hoping it can because, you know, the way things currently are in terms of like, it's not sustainable for the price of an MRI, really, for people yeah. to get an image that like, and also, I think one of the things that people were looking at in regards to like the development of things like classifiers and neural networks around neural imaging mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that there wasn't a lot of data that people had to go on in terms of like specific studies, right? You know, if you're looking at like ImageNet, for example, was trained off medical imaging data for, for a lot of people, and that's good, but like for what we're looking at now, you can produce data sets much quicker with like the time to to record somebody, you know, right. cost less and like you'll get better trained models, I think, from something like this, especially if you get a lot of like data, at, like one point. Yeah. Yeah. I think. What I mean, we... you and you can get a single subject's dynamical data over like a time series. Yeah. Right. So that also would be new. They don't have that from any existing MRI machines or F bold or whatever kind of data. They're always like a few minutes or 10 minutes, 30 minutes long, but they're not over days or weeks. Yeah. I mean, like what we, I, I worked at an MR, like a, an EEG company that focused on long term recording of date, subject data. And that's still the like, the holy grail that people are trying to achieve is really yeah. getting long term recordings. Like we dealt with twenty four hour, forty eight hour recordings for people with an EEG device, and that to me is like kind of crazy. Like when you deal with stuff like that at that level, like dealing it's a lot with, of data. It's a lot of data to go through and a lot to process, right? So like the tools that you have at your disposal for dealing with that at scale are actually really. You get into the big data world when you do that. Yeah. So like I'm kind of curious. Easily. Like, you know, yeah. When you kind of get into that, that's what I'm like curious about. Like, you know, one of the things that often we we had to deal with was also like we look at biomarkers specifically along the lines of like getting data like this. And like, you know, the more people like I guess this might be a play for her later. It's like if she does do a biomarker platform for her her yeah. device i'm kind of curious to see what what it's going to look like because like, the data might look great yeah yeah i mean i'm very interested in keeping up with her also um and seeing what she does but i i mostly am interested in this neurostimulation um I let's gotcha. see yeah so i think we looked at this so i introduced this is this is mary lou um, this is her history. And so her company, Open Water, to do this was just started in 2016. It's not 10 years old, this FNIRS array. Yeah. So I also um, 
anyway, so this is, I, I said this, right? This is the LCD's camera chips. Here are the two links. This is the video that we just talked about. And here's a second one that's more recent. I'm very close to the end. So um, others are developing similar technologies, just so you don't think it's all Gower Labs and open water, right there. Here's a lab. I, I don't, let's see. It's a German university, wustel.edu. I think that's actually like a SUNY system, you know, in the U.S. It's a it's a system of universities. But anyway, this professor um, is developing something to wear for long-term bedside monitoring. And it's based on, um, I can't see it, it's under here. What word is this right here? Oh, hi. High-density diffuse optical tomography, right, HD dot. And it's a, it's a proxy. I don't know what they mean by is used in place of. Um, but it's a proxy. It gives you the same data as an fMRI, and, but it's more portable and it's a cap. It's just the, just like the other images that we saw and you can wear it in a critical care setting. And here's a link to that lightweight wearable cap for bedside functional optical neuroimaging. So this technology, this is current 2023. It's, it's not only um, increasing, it's spreading out, right? This is a different technology. But if you think about it, it's all similar, right? You're using some kind of radiomagnetic radiation and you're getting information from its interaction with the tissue and then using some sort of high level um, mathematical algorithms related to things like Granger causality plus machine learning AI to deconvolute the information that's in that's in the um, the signals that you get back, the data that you get back. So it, it seems very different, but in a, if, if you pull back, I think they're all the same. And then I, this is the end. So this is a review article and um, it's towards neuroscience's use in the everyday world. And here's the link. And it's actually, the rest of the title is that it is mostly about FNIRs, but it does have um, references. It gives references to devices using fMRI because ironically, even though that's what inspired me to give this particular topic and discuss it today, I didn't I didn't get to discuss it because the FNIRs kind of took off and did so much more interesting. Um, so many people did so much more interesting things with it. So that's the end of the formal presentation. And now we can have discussion, which we've been having. No, I mean, I, it's great. I think FNIRs to me often represented an interesting place for, for innovation because, you know, we were dealing with lasers that often give people very high end results for for things like language studies and like we were able to see like one of the longest running NIH grants involves FNIRs. So FNIRs looking at like language development over time for children. And it's still one That's of the interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's still one of the if you look at Haskins Labs, it's still one I think of the grants that people was actually were working on there. Mm -hmm. And like you have a lot of the like I used to work with one of the people from society of FNIRs who like you got to see that kind of community grow a little bit and be more formalized now and it's like really cool to see this now happening you know yeah yeah, yeah. it's interesting well I, another piece I wanted to say though is that you, you also want to watch out for a wearable device that can addressably um, affect your brain under the yes. control of a doctor or is or wireless you know you don't know under who and somebody by the name of James Giordano, I should have put the link up, but he gave a talk to the Naval Academy. A lot of this research has been funded by DARPA, DOD, um, and they're interested in it goes back to 20 years, right? They really want this for uh, people in the in the theater, as they say, right? Warriors going out to war and they want to reduce PTSD and they want to upload information. I mean, I don't really know. I'm not a military person. I don't really know exactly what they want to do, but he is talking repeatedly for years because I heard him talk in California at a national laboratory like uh, 18 years ago on this same topic um, that there are inherent ethical issues and dangers. And one of the more current ones is he's saying is if we implant uh, or use these devices and they add functionality in some way. One of the examples, by the way, is they gave, and I didn't talk about this because we got stuck with the medical stuff, is they are able to have a connection to people wearing caps and you can communicate some amount of information, what you're seeing, you know, what you're doing. And they also found that humans can do things that they can't do with their 
hands. So a woman who had an implant, I think, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. She did have a wearable cap. You'd have to listen to his talk to find out which one. It's not one of the ones we talked about today. First, they tasked her to, to fly a, a simulated plane, right? An, a bomber, F-35 bomber. And she did it. Then they tasked her with flying three simultaneously, which a person can't do. And she was able to do it. And they don't think it's special about her. They're saying that people can do things when they're doing it in the theater of the mind that you can't do with your hands, that you can split your attention oh, sure. in different mm -hmm. ways. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected that. I would think it'd be the same as if you do it with your hands. But anyway, it, I'm wrong. And my prediction was wrong. They've already shown this. And then he's saying, so what happens when you have people doing this? Maybe they get PTSD because they bombed a thousand villages instead of just one in a plane. This is me driving a plane. Um, <laughs> and then you take the device out and now you have to handle the PTSD that you've induced in this person who's not doing that task anymore. That's just one of the ethical issues that he's discussing. And so I would encourage finding James Giordano, just search there, YouTube. There's another, I used to, Joy, Joy Hirsch's lab, who like, I, I like had mm -hmm. like some brief time, I spent some brief time with them working when they were at Haskins. Like she specializes in F -nears, and also she like, her lab to me represents the peak of FNIR's research in terms of like the innovations they can come up with, but also they deal with also like multi-person communication with FNIR's devices. So you'll have like, ah, yeah, like okay. mother child communication between cool. FNIR's and like, <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like Adam Noah's and uh, a lot of other people there often do like really innovative research there and like you can see they often make their their research available to people and like they they do very open they're very open with like their data and like their papers so like there's no paywall there um but like i'm gonna look can, for that yeah you, you should definitely look at them because they they often deal with like they they're also the people who ha like would have like a million dollar f years machine and like they often have the best re like tools there dealing with stuff like this uh, i'd love and, to get my hands on that stuff yeah i mean it's it's one of the like if you look at shimatsu they they think they make kind of the most high end f years device that requires physical opto like phys like physical like fibers for example i still haven't seen any wearable f nears device that's like on par with that like something like that like a shimatsu lab nears like if you ever look at that those are still the highest end device i've ever seen and a lot of the papers that i've seen off like people adopted them now over what we would call the gold standard in f nears was like the the hitachi etg 4000 right yeah and like that's often been like a very good like half a million dollar machine that most most research like organizations dealing with years had access to. Mm -hmm. And like if she if Mary Lou Jepson can replace all of that with just a single cap, that's that's game changer. Yeah. Like if someone can do it, she can yeah. do it. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. Yeah, I, th I think so. And then like also dealing with these I think what what'll be a hard sell for people sometimes might be just like the different techniques you'll have to have and also the new additions to software you'll have once the stuff comes up because once you get into the realm of like whole brain imaging at this scale like and also like this amount of like for example if you get into 48 hour recordings that's that's a lot to go through yeah and well that's what ai is for i mean they go through recordings like that all the time right right like, like youtube scanning incoming videos or something I guess I guess that's true. I I think where with signal processing, I often see though that like the pre processing that you have to work you have to do yeah is just huge. And we had yeah. that same problem with EEG where like cleaning up forty eight hours of like that's data a at a time. Like that's it's a huge to get like curated data sets that you'd want to train models off of, it's a huge yeah. amount of work. So like I, I wonder if this amplifies yeah. this. Like Yeah. Well, that's something to, that's why it's a growing field in the literature, you know, is important to look at. How are they cleaning their data? That's a great, that's a great question. And can we train AI to do that? Because the cleaning is a lot of times you see an artifact or something's not entrained or there's a noise or a 60 hertz blip. I don't know. That's all, sort of old fashioned, but got in and you take it out. I think a lot of that could be automated. 
Well, there's that. And also like, how do you get like, for example, sleep studies, right? Like yeah. our the last company I dealt with, like I worked for, we dealt with sleep studies because we dealt with epileptic patients. Right. And, you know, it's easier to get data from somebody who's relaxed in a fixed state. But how do you get people who, you know, moving around in a scanner is a big problem, right? Like if the kind of data you're trying to get is well, like- Cap oh, solves that, right? It's yeah, moving yeah. with you. Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is F nears too, which is motion. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm more of a, like, I'm more of like, let me see your data first before I like talk about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to be skeptical because these are big claims, but um, I got to say from the work I did preparing this little bit of talking, it, it, I'm trusting that the reports I'm reading are reliable and that they can do, they have the theoretical infrastructure is being built to do what they say. I'm not saying I'm for sure that they're doing it now, uh, but they're claiming to do it now and I don't see a theoretical problem. You are have a more practical uh, bunch of concerns like can they hit the price point and can they be used in the field? And I, I agree with you, those have to be addressed and answered or it's, it's useless, but I'm also, my interest, I guess, as a, as a scientist, as opposed to engineer, is just if the theory works and I it gotcha. seems to work. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I trust. It's it. a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad that that's the case because, I mean, you, for us to not have, I think for me, whenever I see something that's too good to be true, I often wonder, you know. Yeah. Like, Got to be skeptical. Especially because, like, I've heard about this person doing this work for years. Yeah, and like, I haven't heard anything new. But the the thing you're telling me is that there actually is a provable example of her work now, which yeah. is very good. Yes. Yeah, and she also in a talk that I think is eight months ago, she's saying that they're waiting on the FDA to allow them to do human trials. So there's not. I was going to say there's not much to report until she does human trials, but that's not true because the mouse experiment with the glioblastomas and the tissue is a, is a report and you don't need human trials for that. So mm -hmm. my interest though, is seeing her proof of concept on the neuro stimulation techniques, because that's, in my opinion, that's a game changer in terms of affecting the person, right? Okay. Not so much a technological game changer, but a game changer in terms of like you add that with Neuralink and now you've now you got everybody sort of under control, you know, maybe from their from their um, smartphone or something. Ah. <laughs> no, I, I think for me, I, you know, even when I came to look at learning about like TMI, like transcranial magnetic stimulation, right? Like mm -hmm. TMS, mm -hmm. right? It kind yeah. of feels a similar beat to that when I hear about stuff like yeah. this. And TMS does have proven clinical work that does help people yeah and but they're it's less precise of, though i think that's the thing like yeah. that's what we're wondering like how precise can you be with treatments like this like with, right. with chemical treatments you you have like a whole thing of like studies that follow the chemical pathway of the drug you kind of know what the drug affects when the person's there receptors receptors, no receptors yeah. right and you can also track like specifically like what and when something occurs in the brain like they're given that drug you can see it specifically like when like that alleviation occurs and right. like and like what it's affected so you do get a precision with medicine like that, that you're taking orally that i with this i don't know if that would replace any of that but like this would be a nice addition to that yeah and it might replace it because a lot of the um neurotropics and drugs for mental illnesses and stuff are really uh not only do they not always work but there's they're on they're not as specific as you think like there's one i think it's called aricept and when you look it up it finds like 30 different kinds of receptors you know norepinephrine and and serotonin and subtype receptors and i'm thinking how do you know how it works and when i've spoken to researchers in the area they're like oh we just spray it out and some people it works and some people it doesn't we don't really know why I got okay, you. that's not, I mean, I think I would like it if the neurostimulation was a little cleaner than that, you know, because the side effects come from the wide range of receptors that these molecules combine to. You don't, you don't want those side effects often. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I think, yeah. well, I hope it does, does prove like fruit from that then. Because yeah. then we'll follow if, that's, <laughs> if that's the case, like if it's some magic frequency, you have to determine it, then you're, you're better. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. That's like, 
Yeah. Some, some sci-fi territory. Yeah, it's very close to sci-fi territory. And I'm really uh, rereading and studying the older papers, you know, just to, to make sure that the foundation is right. And they seem pretty tight, but we'll see.